All right, here we are, live again from the living room, talking Yay. about photography. <laughs> and we're starting with low numbers again. But that's okay, because the rest of the people will show up, I'm sure. Uh, so, okay, first of all, for anybody who's watching at home, let's see which camera, there we go. For anybody who's watching at home, you can uh, certainly submit questions from the website. Uh, if you're watching right on the website, there's a form down at the bottom of the page. You can type your question in, and I'll get it here on my computer, and hopefully be able to get it answered. If you're not watching on the main web page, just send a, a question to photoclass at maxoutput.com. So anyway, uh, we're going to start today with a little bit of a quiz from the things that we talked about last week. Last week we covered exposure and basic parts of the camera and some basic uh, photographic uh, terminology. So we're going to start with a little bit of a quiz, see how well everybody did. Okay, question number one. I'm trying to take a picture at a surprise birthday party, but all of my pictures are coming out way too dark. What should I do to fix this? There can be more than one answer here. So, first one, turn on my flash. B, use an f-stop with a higher number. Answer C, use an f-stop with a lower number. Or D, turn on the lights and ruin the surprise. <laughs> Anybody have any uh, opinion on what the proper thing to do would be here in this situation. I would say my first choice would be B to okay. uh, go with an F stop. Actually C, sorry, F stop of a lower number. Okay. Anybody else? Helena, you have anything you want to add? Um, I mean, no you could do A, but they don't usually turn out really nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like I said, well, there are multiple answers, so we'll look. And the correct answers here are A and C. A, turn on my flash, and C, use an f-stop with a lower number. A, turning on the flash, will provide more light into the room, so you'll be able to get the picture you want. And then C, use an f-stop with a lower number, will give you a larger aperture, letting more light into the camera. Okay? Everybody follow? Mm -hmm. All right, question number two. I'm taking a picture of a river and want to convey a relaxed, peaceful feeling. What is a good way to do that? Last week we talked about that. Okay, answer A, use a fast shutter speed to freeze the motion. Answer B, use a slow shutter speed to blur motion. C, hold up a banner that says, relax. Or D, wait until someone sleeping in a boat comes along. Any ideas here? B or D, depending <laughs> on what you want in the picture. Okay. But I think B would make the water look really nice and slow and make it look pretty. Okay, all right. Uh, Dustin, you think the same thing? I agree. Okay, <laughs> all right. Answer B is the only correct one on this one. Use a slow <laughs> shutter speed to blur motion. Okay, all right. Move on to question number three. I'm using a flash to make sure that my pictures have enough light, but people standing close to the camera are overexposed and washed out. What can I do? All right, answer A, turn off the flash. Answer B, use a smaller aperture. Answer C, use a faster shutter speed. Answer D, step back and zoom in. Any ideas here? This, is, this one's a little bit trickier than the last last two. By smaller aperture, do you mean like the aperture is actually closed smaller yes. or the number is smaller? It's small, physically smaller. It's okay. closed down smaller. The number is larger, right? Pardon? Does that mean the number is larger? Right. Larger number. Smaller aperture, larger number. Um, is it dark? Where I'm trying to take a picture? Um, it could be. It could. Um, I would turn off the flash and see if that would make it a little bit better. That'd be one thing you could do. I would say C, because if you're going to go with the faster shutter speed, you'll still have the light illuminating everybody, but you won't have as much coming into the camera, mm -hmm. or the film won't be as exposed for as long. Okay. All right. Well, the answer here, answers here might surprise you a little bit. It's all of them except C. And turning off the flash would reduce the amount of light that's being thrown onto your subject so you wouldn't have the overexposed problem with, with them there. Using a smaller aperture, because it's smaller, lets less light into the camera. 
so you don't have your subject being overexposed there. C, use a faster shutter speed, is not a correct answer because when you're using a flash, this is something I didn't tell you, when you're using a flash, your camera usually is fixed at a certain shutter speed and you can't control it. And if you could control it, you might not get it set properly and you might end up with a picture that's only halfway exposed or way overexposed. And then the last one is step back and zoom in. And the reason that that one is a correct answer is because as you step farther away from a subject, less light from that subject actually reaches the camera. If you remember from physics, we talked about the inverse square law. For every doubling of distance, you get one-fourth as much light. So if you step back further, you'll, you'll get a lot less light entering the camera, so you won't have the overexposed problem. Okay? Any, any questions so far? Okay, moving on to quiz question number four. Okay, I have been asked to take pictures of a large family, but some of the people in the back are blurry. What can I do? Answer A, turn on my flash. Answer B, use a smaller aperture. Answer C, use a larger aperture. Answer D, step back and zoom in. Or answer E, yell at everyone in the back for being blurry. I've tried that. <laughs> smaller aperture, do you mean smaller, like size? Physically smaller, yeah. Okay, okay. Unless I say F number, I'm actually referring to the physical size of the aperture. So that means the F number is larger? Right. Um, would that help? Because you said if there's a large aperture, wait, then it limits the size of depth, at least That's the right. size of depth of field. So if you had a smaller aperture, then it would make it more clear? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Any other opinions? That's what I was going to say. It would increase the depth of field so more things in the picture are going to be focused at a farther distance away. Right. Okay. Any other um, possible answers here? Um, Remember, more than one can work. E. Yell at everyone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's see what the answers are. Okay. Answer A. Turn on my flash. Mm -hmm. Because cameras are have an automatic setting and most people use it, turning on the flash will actually cause the aperture to close a little bit because there's more light in the scene. So it'll help to things, bring things in focus. So using your flash actually causes the aperture to be a little bit smaller. Okay, and then answer B, of course, use a smaller aperture, as you said. A smaller aperture means a larger depth of field. And answer C, obviously not because a larger aperture means a more shallow depth of field. Answer D, step back and zoom in. You can do that because once again less light and not only that, uh, depth of field is, how do I explain this? It's, it, there's a ratio there so if you've got a depth of field that's this big at, at a certain distance, moving back will actually cause it to be deeper. So, and uh, answer E, obviously you don't want to be doing that. Okay. <laughs> Alright, quiz question number five. And there's six questions, so. All right. I've opened my aperture as much as I can, and I'm using the longest shutter speed I can get away with, but everything is still too dark. What can I do? A, turn on my flash. Got a lot of flash answers here, don't we? B, use a lower ISO film setting. Okay. Answer C, use a higher ISO film or setting. Answer D, step closer and zoom out. And answer E, come back again during a brighter time of day. Any opinions here? Think about what happens when you do each of these things physically inside the camera. The problem here is that you're not getting enough light, so what can you do to get more light into the camera? C be an answer then? Yes. Because um, it doesn't need as much light right. in order to go onto the film. Right. The higher ISO settings means that it's more sensitive to light, so you need less light entering the camera to expose properly. Can you see the question? Yes. Um, <laughs> I think A and E could be options as well. <laughs> Depends on what you... I mean, if you want to take a picture of the moon, it's not going to work, but... Right. I mean, E is an option as well. Okay. Okay. All right, well, let's look at the correct answers here. A, turn on my flash. Once again, more light from the flash, so. 
Okay, B is not an answer because a lower ISO or film or setting means the film is less sensitive and therefore needs more light, so we don't want to do that. C is use a higher ISO film or setting so we can get, uh, we have a more sensitive way of recording the image. D, step closer and zoom out. Remember, as we get closer, we get more light from the image that we're taking. So we can, uh, we can always do that. And not only that, but zooming out also on most lenses will allow more light to enter the camera. Most, most lenses uh, let you do a larger aperture when you're zoomed out. And yeah, once again, I haven't mentioned that, but uh, that is an option. And then answer E, come back during a brighter time of day. That's always an option as well. And that's one that a lot of professional photographers will like to use. Like, they'll come back to a given scene at a different time of day in order to get the lighting that they want. from the, the not, not only the right amount of lighting, but also coming from the right direction. Because as the sun moves across the sky, things actually look quite a bit different. Okay? Questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and last question. Okay, here we go. Question six. For two equivalent exposures, meaning the same amount of light hitting the film or sensor, selecting a faster shutter speed requires me to adjust the aperture how? A, to a higher F number. B, to a lower F number. C, requires no adjustment at all. Or D, requires me to think too much. <laughs> Any opinions here? There's only one right answer on this one. I think it's B, because as the shutter speed increases, you're allowing less time for light to be exposed to the film, so to compensate for it, you need to allow more light with a larger aperture to compensate for the faster shutter speed. Let's look back at the answers here. Use a lower F number, which is a larger aperture. So, yep, the faster shutter speed means less light is hitting the film or sensor, so you need a larger aperture, which means a lower F number on the camera. Okay? Okay. Are we all straight on this? Okay, I think I think we've got a I think we've got a crowd here that kind of understands the Okay, so just to summarize what we talked about la last week, if you want to let more light in the camera, let's go back to the graphic. Let more light into the camera. We can use a larger aperture, which means a smaller F number. Use a slower shutter speed, which means a smaller number on the shutter speed. Okay, use a faster ISO film or setting, which means a larger number. And then to let less light, we use a smaller aperture, which is a bigger F number. Use a faster shutter speed, which is a higher number. And then we can use a slower ISO film or setting, which is a smaller number. Okay. All right, um, I think I'm hearing some questions coming in. Yes, well, there we go. We've got a question from Anthony. Oh, he's just answering questions. Okay, so let's move on. <laughs> Unfortunately, when, by the time I get your answer, we've already moved on. There's a nice delay in the webcast. Okay, all right, so moving on. Today we're going to be talking about good photo composition. And composition is basically, I've actually got the definition up here, so we'll just go straight to that. Changing the location and settings of a camera to include the desired subject in an interesting and intriguing manner. What was that, Dustin? So that's very ambiguous. Very yes, it is. Broad yeah, that, unfortunately, photo composition is a very ambiguous and broad field. In fact, my next bullet point here is it's subjective and that there is no right or wrong answer. And that Rules are part of, a, uh, part of the photographer's code, which are more like what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. <laughs> so as we talk about all these different rules today, they're more just guidelines. So as you take pictures, there's no way you're going to be able to incorporate all the things that we talk about into your, into your, uh, into your photos. At best, you might be able to get a few, but uh, we'll go over them anyway. Okay, all right, we have our video, our cameraman joining us, so. <laughs> okay, all right. So we'll talk, go ahead and talk about rule number one. And this rule is KISS. Anybody familiar with the acronym KISS? 
it's used a lot with technology and other related things. It means keep it simple, stupid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I mean here is that a lot of times when you're taking pictures, less is more. So you want to avoid distracting elements in your pictures. If you can recompose just a little bit, change your position, zoom in a little bit, something like that, in order to make sure that something is excluded from your picture that doesn't need to be there, you'll have a much better picture overall. Uh, you really want, when you're taking pictures, to focus on the central subject in your picture and then not include anything else. And last week we talked a little bit about using depth of field to do that. And uh, depth of field is one great way of excluding, uh, using a shallow depth of field is a great way of excluding details from the background in your picture. So. Um, I've got a couple of example pictures here that we'll take a look at. Can you use the screen? Yes, I will. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, all right. So here is an example of a picture of a flower. This is in the front yard here. And it's got kind of a distracting background. So, I mean, you can see the flower in the picture, but it's not the primary area of focus in the picture. You really, your eye really focuses more on the fence that's back behind. So now we'll recompose a little bit. It's a little bit um, washed out, but uh, here you can see that there's a lot less in the background. You can focus more on the flower. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say here that a lot of the pictures I'm going to be using today are things that I just went and shot out in the yard a couple days ago just to demonstrate the purposes. They're not great photos. They're just examples of the particular techniques that we're talking about. Okay. All right, so now we'll look at one more. This one will be familiar to, to Dustin. This is an example of a distracting background. <laughs> this poor girl has plant, a plant growing out of her head. So when you're composing your picture, you want to look for this sort of thing and avoid it as much as possible. In this particular situation, I didn't have any choice. It was taking, this is a large group photo, and repositioning would have uh, skewed the picture a little bit and not made it be as, uh, as straight and not as good a photo. So I went ahead and took it, and what I'm going to do on the actual photo is I'll Photoshop that out. But it's certainly best to avoid that in the first place, so you're not have distracting things coming out of people's heads, poles, plants, whatever, <laughs> wires, you know, anything that uh, that doesn't need to be there. So that's rule number one. Uh, keep keep it simple, stupid. I'm not calling you stupid, but that's just the. Uh, and like I mentioned before, the de depth of field, setting a nice shallow depth of field is a great way of doing that. Um, the other thing that goes along with keep it simple is, as you're taking a picture, don't overthink it too much. Go with what your eye tells you. If you try and analyze it too much in your head, you're probably going to end up with a picture that's not quite, uh, doesn't quite have the feeling that you want to convey. It might be technically correct, but it might not be a good photograph from, art from an artistic point of view. So by keeping it simple and just going with what your eye tells you, you'll have a better picture. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Rule number two. This one is location, location, location. Okay? And what I mean by that is I'm referring to your location as a photographer. Uh, moving around to get a better picture is always a good idea. You'll often see amateur photographers just taking the standard picture that everybody else does. Now, if you go to a national park and you want to get a picture of a mountain there, you'll find nearly everybody taking the picture from the same place. A good photographer will actually change his location, go somewhere else in order to get a better picture. And that might involve long hikes or whatever, but that's kind of the sacrifice that a professional photographer might make. So. The rule here is change your position, try a different angle, and get a better photo. Um, along with that, um, mention that zooming is not the same thing as changing your position. Changing the zoom on your lens is not the same as getting closer, for example. Um, the way that a professional photographer uses the zoom on a camera is excuse me, to crop an image, to selectively include image, uh, parts of an image and exclude image, parts of an image as well. He never uses a zoom to try and simulate a change in his position. 
Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you some example pictures here in a minute. And the main reason we do that is because wide angles exaggerate space and distance. Wide angle on, wide angle on, is on a lens. Uh, and that makes objects appear further apart. Okay, and then conversely, zooming in compresses space and distance making objects appear closer together. Okay, and I happen to have an example. Okay, there's four particular photos here. They're all of the same object. I know it's kind of hard to see this, but they're all of the same object, but they're taken with different zoom settings. Upper left is a wide angle lens, and then moving to a slightly narrower or slightly uh, zoomed in setting on, on the upper right and then as we go lower left and lower right we're zooming in even more and if you notice the background uh, in the upper left you see a lot more of the background so the wide angle is exaggerating the amount of space that exists and then the lower right everything in the background looks larger which effectively compresses the amount of space that you're seeing in the photo okay that makes sense it's a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, the first one, first time I read, I heard that, I was like, that doesn't really make sense. But then, when I thought about it, it kind of does. Mm -hmm. So you're actually changing the the ratio of the size between different objects as you're zooming in and out. When you zoomed into this picture down here, did you move back or did you? See yeah, you have to move back in order to compensate. Okay. Yeah, it's a combination of both. And you've probably seen in movies where they'll do uh -huh. the effect where moving, you'll see. Yeah, you'll see. The main subjects stay the same size and in the same location, but the background will get bigger or smaller. And the way they do that is they actually physically move the camera and zoom in or zoom out, depending on which way they want to go. So, uh, as a photographer, you keep that in mind. If you're having, if you're seeing too much of your background, step back, zoom in, and then you'll be able to include less of your background. And that's another example of less is more. So, keeping it simple. Okay, and then. I took a picture of the house here. This is standing across the street, zoomed in a little bit, and you can obviously see the street here and the sidewalk. Then I stepped forward a little bit, zoomed out, and though the house is a little bit bigger in this picture, you can see that the yard actually makes up a much larger portion of the image. So, zooming, stepping forward and zooming out there includes more of the surroundings closer to my subject. Okay. Questions? Okay, let's see. We've got a question from... Okay, question from Jonathan. Well, it's actually on color. We'll, uh, we'll address that a little bit later. Okay, all right. Moving on. Okay, classic... Oh, let's see. Uh, changing perspective. Uh, another thing along with location, location, location is changing perspective. Um... Let's just move up. People like to see things from a new perspective. So in order to get a different perspective, you can try a few things a little bit different. For example, kneeling down to photograph children. I noticed in some of the pictures that Kalina submitted that she was at a low angle. F photographs of, of children are much better when you're looking at their eye level. And amateur ph photographers will just stay in their normal standing up position and shoot down at kids. And it's not quite as interesting. You don't connect with the child as much in that particular picture. Another thing you can do lay down on the ground to see something from a new angle. Anybody who saw the thing last week saw the picture of the basketball pole and how that was uh, a new perspective that we hadn't seen before. Okay, we can also climb on something to get a bird's eye view such as a ladder or stairs or anything else that happens to be nearby. And lastly, go to an upper level in a building to get a picture of something outside. So you're looking out the window and get a picture from, from above. That'll actually uh, is a new perspective that people aren't used to seeing and makes a very interesting photograph. Okay? Questions, comments, suggestions, smart remarks, otherwise? <laughs> okay, you guys are being kind of quiet, so I'm not sure if you're getting all this. <laughs> okay, all right, and, and then we'll talk a little bit more about, a, about high angle versus low angle if we go to the graphic. This is a high angle. This is a dandelion in the yard taken from a high angle. Once again, the natural picture most people want to take. They don't want to lean down. And then just by kneeling down, I get a... Hopefully it'll come up here. There we go. 
a completely different picture. It's the same subject from a completely different angle. So just by changing the perspective, I've gone from something that's kind of dull and un uninteresting to something that's actually much better. Yeah, does you use the shallow depth of fields to separate the dandelion from the grass? Like you right. can still tell that the background is grass because it's green, but it's definitely from the out of focus to the in focus, it definitely creates a different dimension than just like in the previous one where it was like grass and a mm -hmm. dandelion where you couldn't really tell the difference between the two. Now you can clearly see the difference between right. Yeah, and, and in this particular picture, I didn't even have to do anything special in order to make that happen because the grass that you're seeing in that picture, in, where it's out of focus, it's farther away. It's actually physically farther away than when I'm shooting from straight down. So just by changing the perspective, I actually got that shallow depth of field automatically. Hmm. So, Dave, did you have something you wanted? Well, I just, it looks fabulous. I mean, the difference is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, I'm talking about snapshot versus yeah. something that might be a work of art here. The same same subject, just by changing the what angle from which the picture is taken. Okay? Mm -hmm. Alright, and then the other thing we can talk about is taking pictures straight on with an object versus changing angles and get going something a little bit different. So here's our straight on shot. And then eventually we'll get a shot from an angle, which will give us a much more interesting picture. Okay, there we go. So, same same subject, much more interesting picture. One of the reasons that this particular photo is interesting, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this a little bit later, is because of this diagonal angle. If you have diagonal lines in a picture, it's good to have them at least roughly uh, parallel to the corner-to-corner -corner dialogue, or di diagonal line in the photo. So, okay. So, uh, that's all I've got on changing perspective. Yeah, Dustin. Um, in high school, I took a photography class and we watched this. Um, it was a motivational speaker who was a photographer for National Geographic. <laughs> I think his name was DeWitt Jones. Um, and the big thing he was doing was saying, like, he always had these big pictures that would come that would get published when he always least suspected, like, He'd have all these things planned, and then he'd have this thought of like someone yelling at him, saying, Tur "Turn around, do it!" And that was his main line. And he'd always be able to like turn around and look at something different or change something. Um, like one, he was taking pictures of starfish when at this place where the tide was like normally instead of like six feet, it's like twenty feet when the tide's out. Mm. Um, and so all of his first pictures were really normal, just kind of like the basic head-on or maybe slightly different angle. Um, and then he got one where it was very um, low to the ground angle of a starfish, but it still caught all the ocean, and so you have this huge space between the starfish and the ocean, and it's like black sand and this bright orange starfish and everything, and it completely changed it where you would have thought he had done something like incredibly special, but all he did was got down low and turned around. Right. And so sometimes those things can come when we least expect it is just try something small. Yeah. It can always make a big and, difference. And truth be told, a lot of times just that small little change will be the difference between the snapshot and an artistic picture. And professional photographers have learned to take advantage of that. And uh, they've learned that just by changing your position a little bit, or like for example, changing the time of day where you take a picture, that you can get a much more dramatic picture and that's something that's much more interesting to look at. So, yeah, thanks for that. Okay. Okay, any other comments, questions on location, perspective? Okay, well, we're going to move on to the rule of thirds. Okay, we briefly mentioned this last week, but I want to define a little bit better here. Okay, so if, you, if you're taking a picture and you're trying to utilize the rule of thirds, you'll draw an imaginary tic-tac-toe grid over your picture, and then place your subject along one of the grid lines with the most important details at one of the intersections of those grid lines. Makes sense? So we're drawing tic-tac-toe. We're playing tic-tac-toe with our photos, right? So we want our subjects to be at one of the intersection points. Okay? Along with that, when we're taking pictures of people, as a general rule, remember this isn't always the case, but as a general rule, put people's eyes on the top horizontal line. 
and you've got your two horizontal lines and your tic-tac-toe grid, put people's eyes on that upper line. It's a general rule. As you zoom in more, you want to deviate from that a little bit, but that, that's kind of the general rule. Put people's eyes along the top horizontal line. And then where you place the horizon in scenery pictures affects the feeling of distance. So, uh, actually, to best illustrate this with an example picture I've got. Okay, let's see, I'll skip ahead. Uh, just one second, this software is being slow, as it was last week. Okay, all right, um, a little birdie whisper in my ear that this, this shot is actually a good way of illustrating the tic-tac-toe grid. <laughs> so here we have a couple of people taking pictures, and the girl there on the left is on the left third line, and the guy on the right is just off of the, the right third line, but he's close enough to make the picture interesting. Okay? And then do another, another picture with the tic-tac-toe grid. Here's a waterfall, where the waterfall itself is on the tic-tac-toe grid, and the the portion of the waterfall with the most detail appears just over the upper right intersection point. So, all right, and then pictures I wanted to show. Here we have my Utah Lake canoeing picture, and this one I've cropped it in such a way that the water appears on the in the lower third of the picture, and then I'll show a variation of that where the water appears in the lower two thirds. Which one of these feels like the canoers are further away? Yeah, definitely. Definitely on this one. You see more of the water, so it feels like they're, they're further away. If we go back to the other one, you feel like you're a lot closer to those. Even though they're actually the same size in the picture, the feeling is different because of which line on the, in the rule of thirds box that they're placed on. Okay? All right. Any questions on rule of thirds? I should mention here, if uh, we're going to be absolutely accurate, that the rule of thirds is actually a variation of the golden mean that you've probably heard about. Uh, I don't want to go into time to explain that, but it's just a basic guideline on what ratios the human eye likes to see. And two thirds is roughly uh, roughly matches up with what you would see in a golden rectangle, where you'd see the line in a golden rectangle. So. The real pr principle there is the golden golden mean, and rule of two thirds. The rule of thirds is just an easier way of applying it. All right. Uh, so move on to the next principle, and this is something we've all heard before. I just need some space. <laughs> okay. And what I mean by that <laughs> is that when taking picture of people or animals who aren't looking at the camera, give them some nose room. Give them some space above where they're looking. So, for example, if Uncle Bob is looking off to your right, put him on the left vertical third line from the, back from the rule of thirds. And that gives him some, spa some space in front of his face, and it actually makes the picture feel a lot more natural. And start out by a, rule of, a picture illustrating the rule of thirds. And you can see that even though he isn't looking off to the left, the picture is more interesting because he's facing the left, to have that extra space on the left side of the picture there. What so is that? He's holding... It's a hot dog. We're in New York City. Mm -hmm. and we're getting a picture of us getting hot dogs. I have one just like it with me. but <laughs> Okay. And then the next picture. Right, you've seen this one before. Here's a picture of this girl looking off to the right. And so I've placed her on the left third line to give her space in front of her. And if we go to the next picture, I cropped it a little bit differently. And this is being slow. <laughs> One second, and it'll come up. I promise. Okay, here we go. All right, so here's the same picture cropped in such a way that she appears on the right third line, and yet she's looking to the right. And what kind of a feeling do you get from this picture versus the other? Awkward. Yeah, it feels like she's stopped. walking out of the scene. Kind of. Yeah. It feels like she's crowded, like she wants to leave. Yeah, it's got a completely different feeling to it just by giving her... It almost like it completes the picture when you can see like what she's walking towards uh -huh. or something. It feels like 
you know it's she's going to yeah it completes it and last week i mentioned that one of the reasons we do photography is to tell a story and and maybe the pic just having a picture of a girl walking and doesn't necessarily tell much of a story but you feel like more of the story is being told if you can kind of see where they're headed mm -hmm. so if that makes any sense mm -hmm. okay Comment. Yeah, go for it. Um, you could get creative and do a picture of a little kid with a chocolatey face running away from a cake, mm -hmm. and that would be telling the story just with what happened. You know right. I mean? Just an idea. Yeah, that's a perfect example of breaking the rules in order to get a, a picture that uh, is maybe a little more interesting and tells more of what's going on in the given situation. So, like I said er earlier, these are only guidelines. <laughs> They're not necessarily hard, fast rules that you need to follow. Okay? Alright, so any more comments or questions on I need space? Okay. Alright. The next thing we're going to talk about is scale. And definition here. Uh, when you want to emphasize how big or small something in your photo is, include something of a known size in the picture that will give the viewer a frame of reference. So, for example, if you're taking a picture of a mountain, having a picture of somebody standing in front of that mountain will just kind of indicate just how big that picture is. And along those lines, people work great as a subject for trying to illustrate scale in a picture because everybody knows how big people are. And also, uh, it helps for the scale object to be close to the subject. So if you have a picture of a person standing close to you and the mountain's far away, the mountain's actually going to look small. So you want to have the objects be at least somewhat close. So, any questions or comments on that? I have one example here. I'll, I'll, look, at, I'll look in yours here in a minute, Dave. Dave was kind enough to email some pictures early and I just didn't have time to incorporate them into my, my slideshow. But, you know, say for example, <laughs> it's uh, this picture right down here oh. <laughs> is a person. <laughs> yeah, you won't. You hardly even see it, but you can kind of get a feeling for just how big that arch really is, just by how small that picture that person is down there. So there's an example. And just give me. One. Probably potentially make it better if the person was actually inside the arch. Yeah, it definitely would. Um, but that's. Kind of hard to do. Yes, <laughs> location of the subjects. Yes, exactly. Uh, let me see what Dave's got here. Let's see if we've got something that works really well. Um, <laughs> that was kind of amusing, but okay. Well, let's go through all of Dave's here, and then Dave can comment on them. Okay, Dave, uh, what do you got going on here? Oh, there's just a church in Switzerland, and, uh, oh. He's coming a little closer so we can hear him here. Sorry. The idea um, that I get that I sent you that picture is that the church looks really big compared to the mountain. And then I shot, I sent you another picture of the, of the mountains. Yes. And now you can see the church at the bottom and the mountains above, so huge difference. I mean, the mountains now completely yeah. dwarf the church. Yes, and you get a much better feeling of the sense of scale that's going on there. First one is definitely an interesting photograph, but it doesn't really give you an indica indication of just how big that mountain is until you look at this one. So, and once again, this is another example of changing perspective and changing location to tell or just to convey the message that you want to convey. Okay, so we've also got same idea, same idea going on here. And then yeah, it's perspective. <laughs> and this one's perfect. Yeah, oh, yeah. perspective. <laughs> Obviously, not standing in his hand, but uh, just an interesting photograph. The, the trick with that one is, I had my aperture um, really small, mm -hmm. so everything's in focus. Right. So that's that's why the guy back there is, you know, looks like he could be standing on her hand. S small aperture, large depth of field, mm -hmm. large f number. So if you want to recreate this photo, that's how you would do that. Go with a small aperture. Okay, so that's scale. And sometimes you can reverse the scale thing for artistic purposes, like Dave did in the first picture, just for the uh, sake of making a more interesting photograph. Okay, 
All right, so we'll move on to layers and texture. And uh, the reason I bring this up is that photographs are just by their very nature two-dimensional. And in order to get a feeling of what is actually in a picture, you need to do something in order to convey a sense of depth. And there's different techniques for doing that. Uh, one of the things you can do is include a foreground, a middle ground, and a background as three separate elements in your picture. So your main subject might be in the middle ground, and then obviously you've got the background behind them, but you can actually add something in the foreground to maybe try and frame them up or just kind of add a little more interest to the picture. Maybe plants or a tree or, you know, it's just something in order to add a little bit of a feeling of depth. Okay? Um, another thing we can do is we can use lighting to indicate depth. Objects that are farther away tend to be darker. We mentioned earlier that when objects farther away, less light reaches the camera. So objects that are farther away are darker than objects that are close. And your eye just naturally knows that. So if you want to indicate depth, you can do it by the amount of lighting that's on a given object. And along those same lines, side lighting an object makes it easier to perceive depth. If you take a picture with a flash, everything appears very flat. You don't get any sort of feeling of texture because the light source is coming from the same place as the camera. Say, for example, if you're taking a picture of a person and you're using on-camera flash, it tends to flatten all their facial features. They might look like they don't have a nose or something, depending on uh, how far away they are and just how intense the flash is. So, uh, side lighting an object moving the lighting off to the side or taking a picture in such a way that the primary light source is off to the side, say a sunset or an off-camera flash or a reflector, those things actually can add a feeling of depth to the picture because having that light come from the side will add at least some sense of shadows and, and add, add the uh, necessary cues that your eyes use in order, in order to indicate depth. Dave. Um, I just want to say that if you guys use um, windows, it's a great big soft side light. So it, you know, put somebody right next to a window, not straight on, but to the side, and you get a really nice soft light coming off to the side, and mm -hmm. it's just a great technique. Yeah, you don't have to do anything; you just go right up to the window. You know? Right. Yeah, and then that works great because uh, typically uh, either the light from the window will overpower any lighting in the room, or you'll have the room, room lights off. And that provides the side lighting that you need in order to get that feeling of depth in your photograph. Mm -hmm. So that's a great technique. You'll see a lot of professional photographers use that technique in order to just give a feeling of three a third dimension to the photo. Okay. All right. And next thing we've got is patterns. Uh, I'm not sure if I added the photo that I was going to show or not, but any sort of repeating pattern in a photograph that moves away from the camera automatically allow your brain to determine that there is a feeling that there's a third dimension going on that there's some depth in the photograph because you'll see the things as they get farther away actually be smaller in your picture so if you like for example if you take a picture of a brick wall and you do it from the side bricks that are farther away are smaller and your brain knows smaller equals farther away so it's a great technique there as well and then along with and I'll go back here. Uh, side lighting a texture makes the, the, the uh, picture feel more three-dimensional because the shadows convey depth. Same thing with side lighting the main object in your photograph. Okay. All right, and then moving on to depth of field. You can use, your eye and brain can use depth of field in your picture to try and determine distance because as you move further away from the area that's in focus, things become more out of focus and you just automatically know it's more out of focus, it's further away. So you can kind of get your feeling of depth there as well. Okay? Am I going too fast? Are we following? Doing good. I like your examples. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I've got some examples of... Oh, this is another technique that I didn't, I didn't mention, but layer, layering having different layers in the photograph, and we can kind of see the foreground, midground, and background example in this picture. 
we've got the plants in the foreground and the bridge and that's my friend Brian there in the picture in the midground and then the background with the trees behind so we can, we can kind of feel a little bit the sense of depth that's going on there all right and then the next picture my gosh this is being slow okay all right we've got different layers of mountains here to indicate depth and we've also got a little bit of a foreground we can see the just the edge of the road and the, and the bushes there in the front just to give it more of a feeling of 3D and uh, I mentioned earlier that darker tends to mean farther away but in this particular case because of the way the lighting is falling the closer mountain is actually darker and the further one is is, uh, is a little bit lighter but you do get the feeling of depth that I was talking about okay all right here's here's uh, a brick pattern it's a repeating pattern this not only indicates the uh, cues by size but it also indicates by depth of field you can see the closer bricks are definitely out of focus as well as the farther ones and the ones in the middle are definitely sharper okay and you got there's a little bit of a lighting effect going on there too and then, just one last one. This is the fence outside, just by our back door. And uh, once again, repeating pattern and depth of field going on here. Okay? Got questions? Speak up. So, All right, so we'll just move on to the next technique, which is called leading lines. And uh, what I mean by this is that any lines in the picture, and well, there can be lines in the picture which can lead your eye into the desired area of focus. And we'll have some examples here so you know exactly what I'm talking about. But these lines that I'm talking about, they don't have to be straight. They can be created by objects, such as a log in a picture, a stair railing, a road, anything like that, river, you name it. These lines can be created by areas of differing lighting, like a shadow. Or in that last picture we looked at with the mountain, there's a line created because of the different lighting on the two mountains. Lines can be created by different areas of color or texture. So we've got two colors next to each other. There's a line created between those two lines or between those two colors. Okay, and then lines can be created by a series of objects. So if you've got a series of multiple objects in a picture, draw a line between those, and that can be a line that's used. To, uh, to take the viewer's eye to a part of the picture that you want to, that you really want to share. Okay, uh, I'll do a couple, couple examples here. There's a couple pictures from a wedding I shot a couple weeks ago, and we've got these four handsome guys um, in in a line there, and uh, the three behind lead your eye to the groom in front. So, one example. Okay, next one. We've actually got multiple different types of lines here. Uh, the, the columns, even though they're not pointing towards the bride and the groom, because there's multiple of them, they create a line between the line and the, between the bride and the groom. And also, there's some lines on the sidewalk and on the columns. Um, if I can, there we go. And create a line through here as well. So just uh, just some visual cues for your eye to know what you want to see in the picture. Okay. All right. Here we got a few line, a few different lines. We've got uh, line of the sidewalk leading to the flowers. We've got the uh, stems of the flowers leading to the flowers, and we've got the shoes pointing to the flowers as well. So everything in this picture kind of leads your eye into looking at the flowers in this in particular example. Okay. And then an example of a building, and there's lots of lines here. And they not, don't necessarily lead any one place in particular, but they all kind of lead your eye upward to the statue at the top of the tower there. So that's kind of the natural area of focus in this picture. They also all keep your eye in the photograph. Right. Um, that's an important thing. Like. As you look up towards the statue of Captain Moroni, like it still draws you back down, but then keeps you back up. So your eyes stay in that area instead of like 
going up out into the sky and then just off the side of the frame and out of the picture where you're just like, oh, that's, you know, there's this lines help structure keeping you inside the frame of the picture. Right, yeah, and yeah, when you have lines that are in your picture, you tend to want to have them lead towards your subject and not out of the picture, like you say. So you want to have uh, things being drawn in rather than being uh, drawn outside the picture. So, okay. All right, um, we're going to move on. We're trying to keep this class under an hour, and we're at 53 minutes right now. Um, okay, all right. So next thing I want to talk about is shapes. And what I mean by that is anything made up of lines. You can have shapes that are triangles, squares, that are made up of different lines in your picture. And there are certain shapes that are more visually appealing than others. For example, equilateral triangles, triangles with the same side, same size side, uh, are much more pleasing to your eye than, say, a square. So, if you take advantage of this technique, for example, if you're taking a picture of a group of three people, instead of placing them in a straight line, put them in a triangle formation with two on top, one below, or vice versa and it's a much more interesting picture. Okay, uh, I've got a couple examples here. There's the bride with the bridesmaids, and I line them up in a triangle formation just to make it a more interesting picture than having them line up in a straight line. So, there's a triangle shape. And, let's see what else we've got here. One second, bear with me. Okay, here we have, um, there's actually two triangles being formed here. And as soon as I can, I'll draw it. Um, so we've got a triangle formed with the two gentlemen in the middle along with the one on the left. And another triangle being formed with the two gentlemen in the middle with the one on the right. And so that makes an interesting picture. And you, could, you could place them in a square formation, but it's not very interesting to do that. It's much more interesting here to do do the triangles. And one there, and one there. Not quite equilateral, but it's still nonetheless. You get the feeling. Okay, and here, you do not, not necessarily see shapes. This is Dustin's wife for everybody who wants to know. And what we've got here is the human face actually forms an equilateral triangle between the eyes and the mouth. So keep that in mind when you're taking pictures. If you can kind of maintain that look, you'll have a, a better looking photograph. Okay? Alright, so let's see. Did you have anything in particular, you, any pictures, Dave, that really illustrated that really well? I had a couple of cool shaped ones if you want to open that up. Okay. Alright, so just give me. Okay, alright. So Dave's pictures. Shapes, there, there, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, Dave, you want to talk about? Oh, was that in shapes? Yeah. You know, the shapes folder. Oh, I think it was just the, uh, I had kind of a light, a round, it looked like a roundish white shape behind his head that kind of circled him. It wasn't much, it was kind of a subtle round light shape. Can you see that, like a, a halo glow around mm -hmm. his head? That was it. Probably pick it up one. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Alright. It just helped you focus on him. Now, that, you know, that's just a shape I found in nature. <laughs> Bunch of shapes. <laughs> yeah, th this is an example of leading lines, too. Uh, the lines of the feathers lead you into the peacock. So, And this is also a good photograph for color, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Okay. That one just, uh, probably do a different one. That was. Okay, move on. Those are weird lines. That, I don't know, that's just a giant line that is kind of <clears throat> a light bar that lights her up and kind of her arms are also lines and lead you up to her face. And the way she's holding the bouquet, I had it so it kind of also follows her arm and brings you up to her face. Yeah. 
Now this is more of an example of the lines that we talked about than, than, than the than shapes. Well, yeah. I'm, not, I'm messing around, so yeah. And we also have a cool shape there with the light. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is, a trapezoid? <laughs> yeah. But it's got some triangles. Parallelogram, yeah. That's some darker triangles in the shadows. Yeah, so things don't have to be triangles. The other shapes work as well. And a triangle for you. See yeah. that in the trees? Natural triangle in the trees, yep. Same thing again, different perspective. Well, why, why I'm mentioning that, like, uh, we've got an example here of a vertical for, uh, photograph versus a horizontal photograph. Uh, seems like most people, when they're taking pictures, just always want to do horizontal. And as I've be done more and more photography over the years, I've d I'm doing more and more vertical. Uh, it seems to be a little bit more artistic and a little more interesting. Uh, so as you're taking pictures, don't forget to take a vertical version of what you're looking at as well. So, what do we got here, Dave? I uh, was just some, uh, you get that round oval shape and then two oval shapes within the rock. So the big rock is an oval and then there's two little ovals in it and it just kind of has a theme, natural theme to it. And even the leaves are a little ovalish. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. So, yeah, repeating, repeating elements. It's something I don't have on my list, but repeat, repeating elements do uh, make an interesting photograph. It's kind of a pattern. Just has uh, three shapes, three different rocks that are kind of the same. That uh, and then you have the leading lines from each corner that bring you into the center uh, flower. Yep. And then the rocks form a triangle there too. The edges of the rocks. Uh, there's just a lot of angles there. <laughs> <laughs> Look kind of cool. Some long shapes. <laughs> There's a circle shape and a triangle shape for you. Yeah, this would be a good one for a balance, which we'll talk about here in a minute, too. Okay. Let's see. All right, well, let's, uh, let's actually move on. Okay, <clears throat> um, and I also mentioned with shapes that diagonal lines in pictures are uh, kind of interesting as well. You go from one corner to the opposite corner of the photograph, and then diagonal lines in the picture you can place uh, yeah, parallel to that diagonal line. And it feels a little more natural than some of the other diagonals that you might get. Okay. All right. Okay. Any questions on shapes? We're going to be cruising through the rest of this stuff here because we're uh, already at an hour. Um... Okay, the next technique that we're going to talk about, if uh, I get the opportunity to bring up the slide for it here, is going to be balance. And uh, I don't mean balancing on a skateboard. <laughs> but uh, I'm talking about balancing the different elements in a photograph. So uh, the basic technique, the basic... Uh, slide should be coming. Okay, here we go. So balance in a picture uh, doesn't necessarily mean symmetry. And we're being extremely slow here. Okay, you can have balance in a photograph without symmetry. And what I mean by that is if you've got a picture that has a large object on one side you probably want to have something on the other side, but it doesn't have to necessarily be another large object. So you just want to have something that kind of equates the balance a little bit in the photograph. Uh, if you follow the rule of thirds when you're taking pictures, that kind of automatically conveys at least some sort of balance if you're including objects in the, in the picture uh, on the third lines. Okay. Uh, you want to balance areas in your picture that contain detail. So you might have one, one side of your picture that has a lot of detail, and you want to have at least some detail on the other side. It feels kind of an imbalance if you're doing a lot of detail on one side and not much on another. But once again, rules are made to be broken, so um, you might have a photograph that works with, uh, with a lot on one side. And then balancing areas of light and dark. And along with that, balancing areas of different colors or textures. So just overall, you want to kind of make sure that... Um, Elements in your photograph are balanced. 
So looking at this particular picture, we've got the element of, I guess that's a boat down there, being balanced in the opposite corner with the cloud. So a more interesting picture than if there was no clouds in the sky there. Okay, And then we've also got this one here. We've got the clouds in the sky being balanced with the shadow in the bottom. We've got the people on the left kind of being balanced with uh, the buildings on the right, and a little bit to some degree with the, with the statue. And uh, it's kind of a, just a nice distribution of the elements in the photograph. So, um, Did you have any, Dave, that were uh, particularly good examples of balance? There's an example of light and dark in there somewhere else. Which one it is? Just, just to show that you can, you know, use light and dark to be your balance. Say, uh, this one does that to some degree. No, no, that's not the one I wanted. Of course. That was shapes. Be, yeah, that was shapes. It should be the next one, I think. We have to do patience, everyone. <laughs> okay, here we go. There's a little bit of light and dark going on there. You got the bright leaves with the, the darker. Okay, let's see what else we got. That's a good example of leading lines and shapes and everything kind of because I kind of tend to focus on that big leaf on the lower left mm -hmm. and it's of course it's more in focus and it seems like uh, you know the line off to the right brings me down to it the others bring me to center and then bring me down to it again so yeah the lines definitely help there and the interesting thing about that is the leaf that's just above it is actually probably a little bit larger in the picture so if you're going by size alone your eye would be drawn to that one but because of the lines, the stems on, on the leaves there, your eye is definitely uh, led to that lower left. So. Oh, there's a good example. So you might say, oh, that's really ugly, but and maybe it is. I mean, that sky's all blown out. But um, I kind of felt like the white waterfall being a large strip of light and just that little third being the sky kind of balanced it out. So I wanted something a little more interesting than just, you know, just straight on. So, I don't know, I, a little bit of balance there. Yep. And then we got an example of light and dark here coming up. Balancing. Yeah, it's interesting. Balancing the light with a little bit of uh, the light of the dress with the opposite, the dark on the left. On the bark, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And then this one's kind of interesting as well. That one is more symmetric. It's a good balance of black and white. <laughs> yeah. Why don't, yeah, definitely. The black is interesting, I think, because it it gives her attention. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not, and it's she's not too small that you're like bored with it. So. Okay. All right, so uh, balance is one of those concepts that's actually a little bit hard to try and say this is exactly what you need to do in order to achieve it. So I mention it because it's important, but it's really hard to nail down. So you'll know it, you kind of know it when you see it. When you're looking at a photograph, you can say, yeah, this, this balances out this and so forth. But a good photographer will definitely uh, take, a, take a, uh, into account balance when taking pictures. And the last thing that I just want to cover really, really, really briefly, because we're going to have a whole class on, on color um, in week four. Um, but let's say that, that's going to be color. And the reason I mention it now is because colors can be used to convey emotion. A red color, it tends to be kind of exciting, uh, invoking energy into a photograph. Blue is very calming. Yellow is happy, etc. Other colors uh, have different meanings as well. So take that into account when you're taking pictures. Not only that, each color in the rainbow has a complementary color, and photographs are, tend to be very 
a uh, lot, lot more interesting if you've got complementary colors, say a blue and an orange, or a red and a green, a uh, yellow and purple, if you include uh, a proper balance of those. So, so I don't want to spend too much time on color just because we're going to be focusing on that a little bit later. But uh, those are the ten rules that uh, I wanted to cover. Any questions? We have uh, one web question. Uh, this is from Suzanne in Houston. And she says, if you, uh, when you're talking about the rule of thirds, if you take all your pictures using that rule, it seems like your pictures would become predictable and boring to look at. I guess my question, do you want to do that all the time or just sometimes? And my personal opinion on that is the rule of third is pr rule of thirds is probably one of those rules that you want to follow more than the others. Uh, it's just a basic composition rule to make things a little bit more interesting, uh, to make sure that things are more in balance. Um, so tell them about how you're framing. Yeah, things, the, the, for example, the shot that you're looking at right now. There's an the example of the rule of thirds. I'm on the right third, and the computer and so forth are on the left third. And if you'll take the opportunity to watch what's going on with movies and television, you'll see this used all the time. It's just kind of a basic rule that everybody uses when they're shooting pictures, whether it's movies or still pictures or whatever. So, short answer is, rule of thirds is a good rule to follow most of the time. There are obviously times you want to break it, but the general rule is, use it and you'll get a better photograph. So, okay. Um, and then Jonathan had a question, Jonathan here in Provo. So what are some good ideas to get good realistic color out of a camera to minimize editing? And I want to put that question off until next week when we talk more about uh, how to get the most out of your point and shoot digital camera because there are some settings you can do and it also applies to your digital SLRs and there's ways to do it in your film cameras as well. But uh, not to, not to uh, ignore the question, but just we're going to be focusing more on that in another lesson. So, anybody else have any questions, comments? Colleen, you look like you're thinking. I don't think I have any questions. Okay, Christine, you've been pretty quiet. Anything? Dustin? I'm good. It's all very a lot of different things that I hadn't thought about, but they were good. Okay. Uh, with the balance and the shapes and stuff that I've probably seen in my own photographs or pictures, mm -hmm. but I didn't notice were there, so now I can look for it more to see if I can incorporate it or see if it can help out without trying to be overcomplicated. So. Right. Yeah, one of the interesting things about these basic rules is that your brain already kind of knows them. So if you're taking a picture and you're looking through a viewfinder and you think, oh, that's a good picture, there's probably some rules in here that are being followed and you don't even realize it. So I'm just kind of bringing consciousness to the, to the things that you, you probably already know. So, all right, um, for next week, like I say, we're going to be talking about how to get the most out of your point and shoot camera. And uh, so, anybody who comes, go ahead and bring your, your camera, and we'll actually focus on specific cameras related to specific models. So, we'll hook them up and we'll take a look and we'll uh, apply the techniques that we've talked about in lessons one and two with a little point-and-shoot camera. I'll show you how to do some of these things, like getting the shallow depth of field and getting the, the longer shutter speeds and things like that, even though the camera might not have settings dedicated to those particular things. So, anyway, thanks for coming, and uh, if you have any questions, be sure and email photoclass at maxoutput.com. If you have example pictures you want to see, uh, you can also email photoclass at maxoutput.com.